Hi folks, I'm Devok and welcome to the Artificer's Guild, the home of all things Artifact. Today, I have a, a game for you and we're going to go through it in our brand new series, Hindsight, where we review Artifact gameplay, coach the player behind the game and sort of point out where they might have gone wrong, where they could do better and point out the good things they did. It, very importantly, point out the good things they did so that you guys can copy this at home. So today, we have what looks to be a red-green mid-range deck from a player called Covid against a player called Hot Meowth using a blue-green deck. Uh, it's going to be largely creep based and then have some spikes later on. Uh, this first initial stage, not much going on here, just hitting pass and, and trading in. So actually what we should have done there is drop that Mr. Avernus. So we have Mist in our hand. If you've got something like Mr. Avernus in your hand, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Unearth Secrets. Mr. Venice and Unearth Secrets are fantastic round one green cards because for three mana they give you incredible value throughout the game. You really want to get them down early. So uh, it's a bit of a shame that it was in the far right lane you had your green hero, but you still should have been putting it down. You could have put it in this first lane and these two creeps would now have three attack each and they would be getting very close to killing that Zeus. So uh, it's a bit of a shame there. You can still use Viscous Nasal Go here to uh, kill off the Zeus should you want to. And that is what you're going to do. So that forces the player to react. And yep, they're going to drop a dimensional portal. So that's actually pretty good for you. Um, it is going to mean he has a lot of presence in this lane. But forcing out dimensional portals defensively like that can really take away from their, their power here. And it looks like you are going to finally use that Mr. Avernus. And they're going to drop it in this final lane. That's, that's an interesting decision. Uh, I'll pause when we move over to that final lane. But that final lane is now very uh, highly contested and he's going to ramp up with a seven lane finger in the first lane so moving over to this mid lane let's have a little see what's going on here uh, let me just pause uh, unpause rather so you can see that animation go okay so in this lane we have a lot of things going on the enemy has put their Kana in this lane that means every single round Kana is going to spawn another two creeps every single round so they have a lot of pressure here. They also have Drow Ranger, which is an incredibly high priority for you to kill. You absolutely want to kill Drow Ranger, but they're protecting it with this Kana. You now have your Mr. Avernus, which is your incredibly ramp good ramping card. Every uh, rather improvement. Every unit in this lane will get plus one attack at the beginning of the action phase. So this means any unit that you have in this lane will get stronger and stronger over time. You typically want those units to live. But where they're facing up against a Kana lane, your creeps aren't going to live for more than two rounds because they only have four health, and they're going to constantly be getting battered by two or three attack creeps. So the only people that are going to benefit from Mr. Vernus now are your heroes, which is good. Magnus is already pretty strong, and with this Mr. Vernus, he's just going to get stronger. But you are going to lose out on the just general game winning benefit Mr. Vernus can provide, because you're never going to be using these three attack minions. To hit the tower. That's just not going to happen. Uh, it's a bit of an interesting position. I really would have liked it in that first lane, but of course, he already played his uh, dimensional portal there, so I guess you're making the best of a bad situation here, but you're not going to be seeing the best use out of mists here. So let's get back into it. There's nothing you can really do, well, there's nothing you can do at all, at all here, so you've just got to hope that he can't do much. And he's going to play a Salamene, so now this lane is even harder for you to win. And you've just lost all your creeps. So you've kind of got to play with a flow here. See where your creeps spawn. I wouldn't buy that town portal scroll. See where your creeps spawn and play around that. And you're getting one in the first lane and one in the fourth lane. So those are the two very highly contested lanes. Um, hero deployment is probably the single most important part of every game. Um, you want to make sure that you can cast what you need to in all lanes. Your hand is basically red. So I like this. You're making sure there's one red hero in every lane. And you are putting another hero in your Mr. Avernus lane. So this is a great place to put Beastmaster. Your opponent is probably going to look to mid. He shouldn't, because there's no creep spawning. So he's definitely going to spawn in front of Bristleback. So if he doesn't have a way of stopping Bristleback killing Ogre, he shouldn't do that. But I've got a feeling he probably will. Unless he wants to double down on blue in the first or last lane. And he is going to go for that middle lane. So that's a bit of a misplay by your opponent here. You're going to get two armor from Bristleback. Or you're going to force out a pretty decent card. Uh, it's unfortunate here that Axe is uh, pointing towards that creep. So if you don't know, at the beginning of the phase, the beginning of the, or the end of the deployment phase, I guess, the beginning of the first action phase, all the arrows we put put out, and that'll choose 
where units are going to attack. If there is a unit directly opposite it, it'll always go straight forward. And if there is a, not a unit straight forward in front of it, then there's a 25% chance for it to go right, a 25% chance for it to go left, and a 50% chance to go forward. So you hit the 25% chance here, and you'll go into that creep. Uh, nice use of Stonehall... Uh, what are they called? Stonehall Elites. Uh, because they power up every single time they kill a unit. And you're going to be killing that creep unless this guy can stop it. Now, of course, he does have 7 mana, thanks to that uh, seller in his favour, so he might well have a chance. I like this as well. Do this as much as you can in your games. Look over the different lanes. If you're waiting for your opponent to make his turn, and you've already used all your mana as you have here, you've got one mana left. You can't cast anything else. So you just looked at the other lanes. You started planning what you're going to be doing in the next lanes. Use the time that the opponent gives you. That way you don't necessarily have to spend as much time on your own turn. That being said, you get plenty of time. You've got 8 minutes and 21 seconds spare at the moment, so use that time if you need to. So now we see a prayer on the weak. That's going to put pressure on your tower, and it's going to kill your stone hall because of the Zeus passive. That was really nicely played by them. It's a bit unfortunate, so Zeus's passive does piercing damage, and with Dry Ranger, that creep is doing 3, so it does get through your armor, and it does block... It does block Axe for a bit longer, like there are more units here, and he's dealing 9 damage to your tower. There's not an awful lot you can do to stop him here. You just gotta kind of have to take this one on the on the chin. You could really do with some way of removing these Salamene's favors. It just it de matter. It depends on whether you've teched it into a deck. I haven't seen the deck list yet. Uh, and now there's an ignite as well. So this lane is very scary. At this point in the game, you've kind of got to worry because the leftmost lane, the rightmost lane, basically belong to your opponent. He is very far ahead. Uh, nice uh, nice use of Viscous Nasal Good there to get rid of his armor from Treant. And that gives minus two armor permanently, so whenever he comes back, he's also going to die. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, the leftmost lane and the rightmost lane are very heavily in favor of your opponent. You're almost definitely going to win this mid lane because you just cleared it out and now you've got a tanky bristle back in the middle of it. But you've got to win one of these other two lanes. You're kind of a bit lucky here with uh, Dry Pathing onto your creep. And now that creep passing onto your Beast Beastmaster. So you are getting a lot out of this. Or rather, the enemy's not getting any out of this. He's not hitting the tower at all. Uh, and you're just going to pass. I, I quite like that. You don't want to use a Red Mist Pillager there. It'd be a bit of a waste. And you need to start drawing some... Oh, ho, ho, ho. Vesture of the Tyrant. Okay, now this can swing one of the lanes. You have to decide which one you want. Personally, the enemy is only doing increments of 3 damage in that first lane. So a Vesture of the Tyrant in this first lane would mean the enemy's not doing anything and you could maybe try and equalize the lane. But again, he has an Ignite, so your Axe will slowly die. I don't know. I don't think I, I, I'd probably use it in that final lane. The enemy's already committed a lot of resources there, but a Vesture of the Tyrant probably makes it manageable. You can avoid taking a lot of tower damage. This lane is basically one for you now. I like Red Mist Pillager here. The enemy can't do anything about it, and it'll just ramp out of control. There's another one. So that's that's mid lane sorted. You could even TP. You could have TP Bristle back out. So now, this turn, right now, this is an important turn. So the enemy has 9 mana. He can basically do anything. He has a Zeus, so he can immediately kill your Magnus. And you don't really have any way of stopping that if he, if he chooses to use Thunder God's Wrath. He could also prey on the weak. That's another three units, but then your Vesture of the Tyrant deals with that. So I think the play here is probably getting your Vesture out, and probably getting it out on your Beastmaster, because he's the one that can cast more things. So I'd, I'd prioritise getting Beastmaster safe. It kind of sucks if Magnus dies, you, you need his presence, but he's, he's going to die eventually. So I just I say let that happen, and uh, make sure you're protecting this Bristleback. With 9 mana, the enemy can really do whatever they want. Oh, okay, they spend it all, basically, on an Emissary. Which is very scary. Are you going to bait out even more cooldowns? I mean, you, you know he can't for one mana. He can't kill you. He can't do anything else, really. Um, it kind of sucks that, that that wolf went in front of the Emissary. You kind of want it to go in front of, of Drow or Kana. And now the Vesture. So you're taking 11 damage, and the Vesture takes it down... By six, I wouldn't put it on the Magnus. You you, you want your your uh, Beastmaster, sorry. 
Yep, and now you're only taking five tower damage. So this lane has just got a lot more difficult for your enemy. He does have incredibly good board presence, but next turn you've got a primal roar. So you can get rid of at least two units. I do like this because Nezugu here. You've got spare mana, you've already lost initiative. This is Nezugu is one of those cards. If it's in your hand, you've lost the initiative, you've got nothing else to really do, and you don't need it in any other lane if you're not having like some horrible mega battle against an enemy. Uh, I like Demagicum more there because you can get rid of some of the uh, enemy's improvements, but whatever. As I was saying, cards like Viscous Nasalgu, if you've got, if you've already lost initiative, just throw them out. You're not losing anything for that. Uh, the enemy isn't. Oh, he is going to commit. Okay, this is scary. Uh, pause when all the cards go down. Right. So, when you have a nice big stack like this, and the enemy puts one blue hero into it. Sorry, let me draw on the screen. When you have a nice big stack like this. And then he puts just one little blue hero in. One that you've already put negative two armor on. This is a sacrifice. He's going to cast Annihilation and wipe your board clean. So, this round, in this first lane, you need to get initiative. You already don't have it. And I don't know if you've teched for it in your deck. So in this first lane, you just need to... If, if, he, doesn't, if he passes, you need to try and bait a card out of him you need to play something to make him cast something. I'd maybe even say, so you've got to spring the trap. I'd spring the trap in this lane, and if you block, like, these two units, say, that's a big swing in your favour. You might even kill the Zeus with that. No, you won't, because he'll get two armour from Trier. Either way, force it, try and force a card to be played in this first lane, keep initiative for the second lane, and then you need to use enough magic. Because Ogre will immediately die. And then you'll... Be too you'll be too damaged away from this tower, but you will eventually be able to get it. So, this is one place where initiative really is important. And hopefully you recognise that. So this first lane, I love that Axe isn't even dying. He's tanking three units. Oh, okay, he is dying. <laughs> uh, so actually, in the next lane, you can enough magic and bronze legionnaire to make sure you kill the tower this turn. <clears throat> Which is quite nice, because then you can start pressuring it. Yeah, so he passed, so you need to... Yeah, I like the healing self there. Bait out another turn. He passes again. You spring the trap. In this lane. Or maybe this far lane. That's not too bad, because you, you don't necessarily need to... It, this is difficult, see. Bronze Legionnaire is not too bad as well, I guess. You're not... If you spring the trap here to try and bait out a card, you're kind of wasting a... A big card. Spring the Trap is a very important card for you. So I quite like that play. I don't think it'll bait anything out of him though. I think he's perfectly happy to do that because you're going to take... Oh, no, he uses a Thunderhide. Okay, pass. You did exactly what you needed to do. Well done. You are definitely losing that first lane now. And you need to kind of worry about the Snowball and him taking it all the way to Ancient. But I think... You have faster ramp in that middle lane with your Red Mist Pillagers. So you pass. He, well, he's he got blink, a Blink Dagger now. So this is him saying, I will take this tower and then I will abandon it and I'm going to destroy you in one of the other lanes. And that's kind of going to suck. He's now got so much crazy mobility. Enough magic, nice. So you read that. You knew he was going to annihilate. Well played there. Still two more damage left to go, but it happens. Now in this lane, probably Primal Roar. Primal Roar on the Beastmaster, get rid of the Kana, and the Roseleaf Druid. That means he's down by one mana. He does have initiative, so he'll probably use his Emissary. If, unless he's got something big to cast, but... He could Thunder Gods and immediately get rid of you. No, he's going to unearth in lane 1. That was interesting. You definitely unearthed in lane 2 there. Or middle lane, sorry. Because then that's definitely going to get hit every time. So this is good, you get rid of the blue... He, he can't cast any blue cards after you do this. Equally, you can't cast anything, but it traps Karn in another lane. Hopefully it's mid. Don't spring the trap. Okay. Interesting. I'm trying to see why you did that, maybe? Because they're both just going to die now, right? Oh, no. Very nearly. I guess Beastmaster dies here. He comes back. 
And maybe he spawns in a better location. Maybe he can primal roll the emissary. You do have two units going back this turn. But you have now given him 13 gold. Uh, again, the magic wall is just nice here. You don't need the fountain flask, but yeah, you can take it to stall. At this late point, at this late point in the game, taking consumable items that you can just spam to effectively pass your turn, but not pass, uh, are really handy. Because if you're trying to bait a card out of your opponent, if you pass and you're already effectively behind, they can just pass into you and they'll win. So uh, you need these sort of stalling cards. Uh, I think your Beastmaster just spawned in front of their Drow and next to their Kana, which is perfect for a Primal Roar. So likewise, now you need to keep initiative for the last lane, which you've got initiative now, so just pass. Pass in this middle lane, and then you can Primal Roar in the first lane. The enemy can't cast anything. That's pretty nice. You're not really going to get... Oh, will this kill anything? Uh, it kills your Darkseer. That kind of sucks. It would have been nice to clear more of his board while you had the chance. You should be able... Yeah, you're going to be able to kill the Drow this turn as well. Clazarim Aragas is kind of annoying, but you've got a lot of good tech in your, cut, in your hand, rather. Okay, so now he's going to annihilate this lane. So you kind of have to enough magic again. Otherwise, he's just going to... He's just going to annihilate the lane and stop you from taking it. But that makes that lane a perfect primal roar now. You move two units and stun drown. So, okay, so you definitely primal roar that last lane, this middle lane. Enough, you've got to enough magic. If you don't get this, you've got to commit axe here next round. I like that play. That's just the right thing to do. Kind of sucks. He'll probably annihilate with the Zeus next turn just to get some value out of it. You've just got to hope that he doesn't gust. If he gusts, you're kind of a bit done. And there's a gust. That is a shame. Uh, you can still... I would potentially still Fountain Flask one of these heroes. Actually, you know, you know what? I would pass. Because you don't... You're winning currently. You will kill his Drown Ranger in your books. So that's kind of a win. Yep, so nicely done. You're only taking four tower damage as well. That's perfectly fine. You really need to stop this emissary though. This emissary is getting a little out of, little bit out of hand. I mean, look at that Roseleaf Druid. It's got seven attack and six health. That is ridiculous. It starts with two attack. Okay. So he's looking to draw something here. He's just hoping. He should use his emissary. Which will effectively undo the damage from Diabolic Revelation. That's a nice little combo. Or you could pray the weak. If he prays the weak here, it actually doesn't do anything because you've got Vesture of the Tyrant. Guys, Vesture of the Tyrant is a ridiculous card. Unfortunately, Emissary kind of just dunks on it because you're adding damage to something that's already there. Higher damage values are good against Vesture of the Tyrant. Lots of instances of smaller damage, rubbish against Vesture of the Tyrant. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Vesture of the Tyrant grants your tower three armor. So you'll see here, just underneath our tower, We've got three armor, and that is from this man's Vesture of the Tyrant. And it, it, it is just absolutely fantastic. There is very little in the game, or there's, there's basically only one other card in the game that comes close to doing anything like that, and you have to pick a Mazzy for it. I'm not entirely sure why I use that Fountain Flask. You don't need to bait out things here, unless you're worried. Okay, so I do kind of like it. So by Fountain Flask, you Magnus there. You make sure that next turn he can't be Thunder Gods. So you can still cast green cards in this lane and you have an em emissary. That was a nice play. Unless he's got something to block it. That's an extra 11 damage to the enemy tower. And he passes. So you do lose initiative for it. I see you trying to use the, uh, the mace there. When you're silenced, you cannot use heroes' items either. I know that's not how it works in Dota, but that's how it works in Artifact, so get used to it. So now you've won middle lane. Unfortunately, you've lost both of your Rebus Pillagers, which kind of sucks. So maybe you do put Axe in that first lane to uh, to stem the bleed there. I do kind of like that play. He's going to put Ogre in mid and try to annihilate again. This time, just let him. Honestly, just let it happen. And it's a good, good idea to put Axe here, because now he's put Drow here, hoping that this is a safe lane for Drow to live in. And you actually can just try and kill her. Of course, you're not going to be able to draw anything new. So, or you can cast Primal Roar, and that's not really worth it. Unless you want to try and roar away 
the Earth Thunder Hide, but if you're if you've not got particularly good luck, then that's definitely going into the final lane, and you would lose the game straight away. There's the annihilation that he's been holding on to for God knows how many turns. Aren't you glad you got the tower down before he did that? And now you have initiative going to the final lane. Uh, I don't think you really need it. You kind of want to develop an emissary here. So if anything, you want to stall. Nope, you're going to prime her off. That's actually quite nice. He gets rid of both the enemy heroes. And one of them gets stuck mid. Perfect. You can now summon your boar because you've already lost initiative. So why not? If you're lucky, it'll go on to that, uh, that Roseleaf Druid and kill it. Nope. Oh, but it does save Magnus. So that is that is a nice little play there. So he's got Zeus coming back this turn. And you've got Darkseer coming back this turn. So, you could potentially put... Ah, uh, I've just noticed that that Trium Protector has a Blink Dagger. So you could put Darkseer in the first lane if you want to Blink Axe over. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Darkseer's ability... Let you move a unit from one lane to another lane. Or you could just put Darts here in that final lane and nope. So you're going to put him there and you're going to move Axe. I like this play because you can now cast a green or a red spell in the first lane and move it over. Move over the Axe if, if you don't need uh, as many units in this lane. You can also cast Mists and Unearth Secrets from this lane using the mana that you otherwise just aren't using. Zeus and Trien, so the enemy did a similar thing here. He put both of, well, he now has both of his heroes with Blink Daggers in this first lane. Just in case he needs to cast something, or so that he can cast something, like a Thunder God's Wrath, and then blink them to the final lane. So both players having a similar sort of idea here. You want to put Unearthed Secrets either in this first lane or in that last lane, and you definitely want to put Miss of, oh, never mind. <laughs> oh, and that silenced his ability. Oh, that was genius. So seeing that you could use your Darkseer ability to move Axe into the final lane, the enemy has now gusted you, which you didn't account for, and to be fair, I didn't account for either, and now you cannot move that hero into the final lane. Fortunately, Axe is eating a lot of damage, so you're not in risk of losing your Ancient here. You do have initiative, so I'd probably just hold on to it. There's no point in using your Golden Ticket. Which, I like this pickup, by the way. If if you're terribly far behind, or not terribly far, but like in this game, if you're kind of on the losing side at the moment, pick up a golden ticket. If you see it, and you've got the gold for it, and there's nothing better, why the hell not? Maybe you random and get another Vesture of the Tyrant. That would basically win the game. So it looks like the enemy is trying to push for, for victory in this lane now. And this is a really good play. So he's pressuring you in two different lanes. I got you. If he's smart here, oh, cheating death. That's kind of going to suck in that final lane. And he should blink both of those units out now. If not, at least just the tree end. Because Axe will die to the the uh, Thunder High Pack regardless. And tree end is just another body in that final lane. And it's something that can cast a spell in that final lane. And where's it going to drop? Right in front of your Magnus. So Magnus can probably kill it, but... It is blocking a lot of tower damage. And it's got cheating death, so maybe Magnus doesn't kill it. You really need some improvement condemn in this in this deck. Red has plenty of options. I don't know whether you're just unlucky with drawing it or whether you're just not running it. I'd almost be tempted to TP Axe out now. But yeah, it just let it happen. Absorb some damage. Passing in this middle lane is just going to happen. Uh, so now he's pressuring all three lanes. Interesting. He's already lost initiative. And he might have plans for the final lane. I guess dimensional portal in this final lane doesn't really help. Because of your Vesture of the Tyrant. But at this stage of the game, basically everything helps. Um, here you really want to develop your Emissary of the Quorum. Please. Uh, actually, you don't have anywhere to put it without it dying. Um, Yeah. That's kind of sucky. You don't want your emissary to die the first round. I mean, you can put it in front of... In front of the Roseleaf Druid. Use its ability and it won't die. Or you can put it in front of their emissary. Use your ability and it won't die. But if he has any way of doing damage to that unit... It's kind of going to destroy it. Gust, here is the one, the one time Gust isn't OP. Right? Because it only silences enemy heroes. 
so you can still use your emissary's ability. That is actually really nice. And now he has a second dimensional portal. So this is why he used it in the first lane, because he doesn't care. Look at those cheating death cross marks. So if you don't yet know, cheating death gives the units affected in that lane. If they would die, there is a 50% chance that instead of dying, they will come back with one health. Oh, you got another Vestry of the Tyrant. Oh, that is sickening. What is that crazy luck? Alright, this goes on Magnus. Magnus still dies, but now you have six tower armor. Now, unfortunately, the enemy has a, uh, an, em an emissary of the quorum. So, a lot of units are going to be able to pierce through, or a fair few of their units are going to be able to pierce through that six tower armor. But you look at this, like, they've got 15, 23 damage would be coming at your tower. But you have two Vestry of the Tyrant. So, instead of 23 damage, it's only doing, what is it, seven? That's absolutely ridiculous. And if you can somehow stem the flow of bleeding in that final lane, next turn you've got two Primal Roars, which will be unlocked next round. Again, I like looking around. You're looking at the first lane. Ooh, that is a that that is a disgusting play. And now you've lost the game. Okay, we're rewatching that. Okay, this this is what this blue deck or one of the combos this blue deck can do to win a game. Pause. There we go. So, Annihilation condemns all units. I just drew through it. Condemn all units, right? Every single unit on this entire board is dead. You have 13 health, but you have two Vestures of the Tyrant. So you're coming back. This effectively is good for you, right? Wrong. Cheating death. Cheating death, if a unit would die, whether that be through combat or condemning, there is a 50-50 chance it survives. So, by playing Annihilation and Cheating Death, you're essentially saying there is a 50-50 chance I will win this game right now. You just had insane luck in getting that second vesture of the Tyrant. That probably worried the enemy to the point where they think, oh no, I might lose the game. If he's so lucky to get a second vesture of the Tyrant, I am lucky enough to win by Annihilation. All of your units now will die. All of these units have a 50-50 chance to survive. And, as we see in the results, unfortunately, he only loses two units out of all of his cards. So he decimates you and wins the game. That's an unfortunate way to lose, but there were a couple of things that you probably could have done better in that one. A lot of the time, you were behind from the start. You couldn't choose whether to go for that right or left lane. I think you need to make that decision a little bit earlier so you can commit some of your better resources to that lane. Equally, the very first turn even, you missed the opportunities that missed of Avernus. So, all in all, it was a pretty well played game, but there are a couple of things you can definitely work on. And this is something that I wanted to highlight to you guys. Because, as you probably may well have figured it out, Covid is just Deerbok backwards. This is actually a game I played through, and I am still making a ton of mistakes. Albeit in this particular game there weren't any massive glaring errors, they were mostly just little mistakes I made here and there, playing too quickly or not seeing that the enemy had cheating death annihilation combo ready and awaiting. Um, so what I guess I really want to say is, yes the beta testers do have a bit of a head start, but they're certainly still human. They still make a ton of mistakes and they can still fall for some of the oldest tricks in the book like Cheating Death Annihilation. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this format. I hope to be able to do this for some of your guys' footage in future. I will be putting links to how you can upload footage in the comments below, and I'll work on some sort of instructional guide for you guys, how to upload your content, so I can review some of your games. So, stay tuned for that in the future. But, as always, if you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to hit like and subscribe, and I have been Divok of the Artificers Guild, and I'll see you next time.